battery sizing. Batteries are a fascinating aspect of the solar industry and could easily overshadow the solar industry in the years to come. But real applications of batteries are a little bit different than what you might initially expect. Many homeowners expect batteries to be an economic solution to resolve the mismatch between solar production, energy consumption, and grid policy. If a utility does not provide a good net metering policy, storing the energy on site in a battery to use later can lower the electric bill. Even without solar, if the utility has a time of day variable electric rate structure, it might be appealing to charge the battery during an off-peak time and use the battery during a peak time to lower the electric bill. But batteries do not have infinite life, and there is a real cost to buying and installing and running the battery. So let's assume the batteries of the Tesla Powerwall 2 comprise half of its $6,700 material cost, resulting in a $250 per kilowatt hour price of storage for the Tesla Powerwall 2. The Tesla Powerwall 2 is rated for 37,800 kilowatt hours of energy output, leading to a nine cents per kilowatt hour hard cost, which does not include installation, sales tax, design fees, or any other project expenses aside from the hard cost of the batteries themselves. Utilities who are keenly aware of battery life cycle costs can simply adjust their policies to render residential battery ownership as a luxury rather than a cost-effective expense. A time of day rate difference of nine cents per kilowatt hour would result simply in the customer trading one bill for another, um, or even losing money if all the project expenses were fully calculated into that battery cost an economic rate differential would have to be about twice that amount or closer to 20 cents per kilowatt hour in order for the battery in the long run to be a cost-effective investment for the battery owner. Of course, some customers will pay for this uh, luxury to spite the electric company that fails to provide them with good solar policy. Uh, others will value the utility of having some backup electrical storage on site. But the point is that it's very hard to make batteries economic under most residential electric rates. Lead acid is cheaper, but generally speaking, lead acid is only cost effective when storing multiple days worth of electricity, an expensive proposition for any customer. It is an expense off-grid customers will pay for because they have to, not because they want to, in order to avoid some even greater cost of expanding the grid out to their point of use. You know, sizing a battery for off-grid operation is a relatively simple matter. Take 12 months of electric bills and divide by the days in each month to get an average power consumption per day. Um, summer and wintertime extremes require special attention. Remember PV Watts from earlier? PV Watts data can be exported into a spreadsheet, revealing the solar production figures that are not only monthly, but also for each hour of the day. PV Watts models typical weather for a given month, and so will reveal how many cloudy days in a row a customer should expect for their off-grid setting. Beware that PV watts will not model an unusual hurricane or blizzard, but that is what a backup gas generator is for on an off-grid site. In my off-grid models, I start by guessing the battery size and seeing how it impacts the model. Uh, then I recharge the battery capacity with the hourly solar production figures from PV watts and subtract out the hourly load consumption that I calculate from the monthly electric bills. I then model a few different battery and array sizes as well as generator capacity and runtime to ensure the battery bank does not run out of power at any point in the year. 
for off-grid planning, I think it's best to design the system to not need a gas generator, such that the generator is only there for backup. That said, I work in the southern half of the USA, in the extreme north part of the USA. It is easier to assume that a few days of generator use will be necessary in the winter. In any event, it is useful to plot solar production, building consumption, generator use, and battery capacity on a graph throughout the year. You know, at some point, the solar array will be large enough to where increasing its size further won't yield any more energy advantage. Um, while solar will produce power on overcast days, that largely depends on how thick the clouds are. So there will be periods of time when the solar array is not productive during the day. Increasing the size of the solar array on that day does the client no good. If off-grid living is not desired, a well-sized residential battery might be sized to eliminate solar outflow onto the grid. As a rule of thumb, batteries that store two-thirds of a solar array's daily summer production will be large enough to stop an array from outflowing onto the grid. And again, for anything smaller than multiple days of storage, I'd recommend lithium-ion even if cost forces the customer into second life batteries from the electric vehicle market rather than buying new. Without getting into those details, lead acid batteries cannot be discharged as quickly as lithium ion without significant efficiency loss. So a lead acid battery which stores anything less than two to three days worth of power will not lend good results to the end user. Also, be aware that most homes, particularly all electric homes, will use more instantaneous power than what a single residential battery inverter will output. But battery inverters are expensive, so you know solar inverters are only one way in that they take all the solar production and push it out onto either the load or the electric grid. Whereas a battery inverter is two ways in that it both charges and discharges the battery. That makes battery inverters cost about twice as much as their batteryless one-way counterparts, which makes the project all the more expensive if whole house battery backup on battery inverters power is required. Today, common solar battery inverters will only back up critical loads rather than output their power to the whole house. And because new residential lithium ion batteries can cost over $300 a kilowatt hour just for the battery itself, most solar customers are only purchasing enough storage to power a house for a few hours rather than a few days. All that said, this is an emerging market that is rapidly evolving. Some companies are focusing on load controls to manage a building's electrical load during battery operation in order to better allow for whole house power during a grid outage by making sure not all the appliances in the home turn on at the same time. More on that later. At any rate, Storing two-thirds of the daily summertime production of a solar array strikes a good balance of keeping most of the solar electricity on site for consumption while providing enough power to the home during emergencies, whether it be powering a critical load or powering the entire house for a few hours. Commercial customers have a more optimistic picture for batteries Larger commercial customers are billed differently for electricity than residential customers, which creates a cost savings opportunity. Maybe half of a commercial electric bill is the kilowatt hour energy rate. The other half, and it varies wildly, is measured in kilowatt demand charges, which bill the commercial user for the 15 minute maximum peak power use of the entire month. Let's assume that half of a commercial electric bill results from the maximum 15 minute power draw of a building. The obvious solution is to use the battery during that period of maximum demand only. If the building does not experience its peak demand during the day, then the solar array component might not even be needed. And a battery that offsets 5% 
of a building's energy use might reduce its electric bill by 25% or more, a one to five payoff. Compare that against a batteryless, net metered residential solar array, which produces 100% of a building's energy use and offsets the bill by 100%, that's a one to one payoff. So to understand that commercial batteries with or without solar have the potential for much better economics than batteryless residential solar or even residential solar with batteries for that matter, you know, if a commercial solar battery were designed to eliminate 100% of the electric bill, it would only save at a one-to-one -one ratio. But ironically, if the project were smaller and only targeted peak demand, the project becomes more cost-effective. This requires substantial modeling based on building interval data that can be obtained either directly from the utility or through logging into the building's electrical account online and downloading it directly. I then model my solar battery peaker plant in a spreadsheet similar to my off-grid designs. But on a real project, I'll use the commercial design software Energy Toolbase to hone in on the optimal configuration. The building load profile is literally the shape of the building's power use throughout the day. The load profile gets spikier towards the top and levels out as the building transitions from peak load to base load. The most cost-effective commercial solar battery only targets the spikiest of peak loads to provide the greatest demand savings for the smallest system purchased. So almost every commercial facility on a demand charge can install a small cost-effective lithium ion battery for demand management with or without solar. I like Energy Toolbase uh, because when I'm doing commercial solar sales, there's there's nothing better than getting the CFO to smile and presenting a CFO with a clear and accurate depiction of the true project economics is is you know the the first part of the conversation. And the second part is. Is it a good economic deal or not? And if it is, then you got your project. So, um, you know, I would take engineering economics classes in, in college and be trained to produce cash flow diagrams like this. It's evident that, you know, Energy Tool Base knows what they're doing uh, in terms of uh, economic modeling. So it's a, a very accurate economic modeler. Uh, particularly useful for commercial you know the the same level of of detail that Aurora brings to its 3d modeling energy tool base brings to uh, economic modeling and visualization of site energy use so the you know the best way to use energy tool base is to have interval data you know 15 minute usage data of a facility and most commercial uh, businesses should be able to get this data from their utility. Uh, some residential sites have it as well. Uh, but what we're seeing here is uh, a day where, you know, back in here, dark blue, the building's energy load uh, is normally, and then we have a, a solar array that turns on in the middle of the day. And so the new building load it has this, you know, instead of having a big, tall uh, midday peak, it has a little morning peak and then a little afternoon peak. Uh, but, but the solar array has reduced the building's peak demand throughout the day. And so that's good. You know, demand electricity is expensive. But most solar installers who, you know, have looked at commercial solar know that, you know, the, the true demand savings for this day don't matter if the very next day you have a, a partly cloudy day and so the, the building's 
demand if the solar array turns off because that one cloud in the sky has inconveniently located itself on top of your array. You know, if uh, that's the case, there's no demand savings for the entire month because demand savings are calculated not on a day-to-day -day basis, but what is the maximum 15-minute period of peak demand. And that can comprise, in some cases, 70% of a commercial electric bill and sometimes more. You know, it can get real extreme. And so what Energy Toolbase does is it takes your interval data from your building and your PV watts, you know, hourly data, and then you can also add a battery. And so now what it's modeling is, okay, this is a partly cloudy day, but on the, that time when the building load would normally be high, but the solar array is turned off, you know, we're running a battery to keep that building consumption level. And so all of a sudden, commercial solar becomes possible for economic project work, where as in the past, we have not had batteries. And so commercial solar was this random chaotic mess of very little economic return. You know, now we have solar sitting on top of a commercial building, providing demand electricity and a, a battery that only runs for you know a very small amount of storage you know that's only storing maybe you know three or four percent of the total facilities energy use for the the day uh, or maybe even less than that but we're just you know we're not trying to do the entire electric bill of the building we're just trying to shave off the peak in a cost-effective manner What's even more interesting is if the, the client didn't have budget for this large of a, of a system, just focusing in on the very peak can be even more cost effective. And so small projects in this space, you know, a, a solar array with a battery that is a, a system for a large luxury residential that same system, you go and put it on top of a commercial facility and the payback might be, you know, in, in five or six years instead of 12 or 13 years. Or the payback might be in 10 years if the payback would be 20. You know, it can, the, the most cost effective payback in solar right now is in the commercial sector doing these uh, kind of solar peaker uh, plants. So Energy Tool Base even has my little electric cooperative in coastal Mississippi in their rate database. So you know what they have found is despite all the utility rate tools that are out there, you know, the most accurate way to model rates is to open up every single one in the entire United States and program it into a database. No, it's, it's not a perfect process, but a company whose job it is to keep track of that stuff is going to do it a little bit better than what you can do uh, on your own. Um, and, and for the most part, it works great. Um, you know, I work in some pretty rural areas in Mississippi, and if something works, we're, we're happy with it. It doesn't have to work great. Uh, Anyway, I just moved apartments, and uh, I, I was taking a look at different rate structures, and even though my electric cooperative does not have a very good solar policy, they have a pretty interesting time of day rate structure. And so... In the summertime, between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, Friday, I have this peak rate and off-peak all other times. And in the winter, instead of being a three-hour period, it's only a two-hour period. Again, weekdays only, off-peak other times. The meter fee for time-of-day metering or regular with this co-op is the same either way. 
Without time of day metering, I get a flat rate of nine cents a kilowatt hour. With time of day, during the peak period, the electric rate quadruples. And then during the off peak period, the electric rate gets cut, you know, in half. You still have this rather large meter fee. But let's just take a look at look at this. If it's three hours a day, five days per week, you know, that's that's nine percent of the year. Well, you know, it's they call it peak for a reason. And so, you know, let's just be a little fudge our numbers a little bit on the the conservative side. Let's call it ten percent of the year. So for ten percent of the year. During that time frame, the electric bill will increase by 400%. And for 90% of the year, the electric bill will decrease by 50%. So let's assume you're uh, either by having a solar array that's on during peak times or having a battery that runs during peak times or by, you know, what I do is I use uh, my home automation system to uh, change my thermostat settings and uh, turn my heavy appliances like my electric water heater and refrigerator off and, and coast through the peak time. So I, I solve this issue without solar or batteries. And that gives me about a, an even load distribution you know, without solar or batteries during those peak times. So I, I do some load shifting uh, to reduce my energy during peak times in an automated fashion. And so 10% of my bill is going to increase by 400%, and 90% and of my bill is going to decrease by 50%. And what that gives me is a 5% a monthly reduction on my uh, electric bill by switching over to time of day metering uh, for doing relatively nothing. If I went further and and really you know you know throttle that that thermostat, if I said you know I want to turn my refrigerator off for three hours, and so you know I'm going to get two refrigerators and fill both of them halfway up with thermal mass and just completely kill them total uh, for those three hours. If I went extreme about it, I could, you know, if, if my, my peak energy use is half of an even distribution, if I go very Spartan with my peak energy use, you know, my electric savings could be, you know, 30% or more, you know, before I get into storing it into a battery. And so sometimes these time of day rate structures can be uh, particularly advantageous. Now, batteries are interesting. Batteries mean that we don't need to uh, generate all of our electricity. We don't need to store all of our electricity. Maybe we can do exactly what is just right to optimize it to our rate structure for the greatest you know, return on our investment. And so, um, you know, it, Energy Toolbase will model the state of charge. You know, I think it's, it's very useful to get into the Energy Toolbase data and, and try and, you know, tell yourself, you know, okay, well, on this day, my battery is being used, but I'm not fully draining it down to zero. Uh, you know, on, on the next day, I am you know, draining it down further. So what's different between the first day and the second? Oh, you know, we have uh, a larger midday peak and that takes it all the way down. And so if I wanted to make sure, you know, you know, if I, if I had a larger battery, well then I would not just be shaving this peak and this peak, but also that peak. And so now I'm running my battery more you know, if I wanted, if I called this base load and downsized my battery, you know, then I'd only be looking at a system that maybe did that much. And so by being able to kind of see the data, you can hone in on, you know, what the optimal system is for cost effectiveness. 
and they have some optimizing algorithms built in to kind of steer you towards the best system size. You know, here we're modeling uh, a time of use rate structure for during the week and then a separate rate structure for weekends. So we're modeling our off peak period and our peak period. You know, what I did is I just went and modeled it without solar or without batteries to see what switching to time of day metering would do. And so, uh, you know, I had to go and, and plug in my energy data. Now, I did not have the, the interval data uh, to plug into energy tool base. I did not have green button data. All I had was my month-to-month -month electric bill. And so I was able to log into my electrical account and, and get my consumption history for each month, but that's it. And so what Energy Toolbase does in that, that is though you plug it in and then you have to go and, and, and tell it, okay, what part of that's going to be peak, what part of that's going to be off peak. Um, and so I modeled about, you know, 10% of my energy in that time frame being a uh, uh, priority peak. Um, you know, here we're, you know, we're able to select between the flat rate and the time of use rate. And so, you know, I, I didn't actually get all the way through their reports. I just looked at, you know, what's nice about um, energy tool base is some of the numbers it, it puts in the corner and it calculates as you're changing things around so you don't have to get all the way to the report to see how you did. Um, but in short, uh, what I found is that just by kind of doing nothing, I could save you know, uh, about $300 a year off my electric bill by uh, switching on to the time of use metering structure. And if I, I kind of kicked up my digital controls, I could save, you know, as much as, as another $200 while still using, uh, you know, some peak energy, even without solar or batteries. And so, you know, I'm, I'm potentially saving, uh, you know, Three hundred to five hundred dollars a year in electric savings, you know, by by implementing smart home technology uh, and also taking advantage of this time of day rate structure. Uh, so that's that's kind of interesting. If you have the option of a couple different rate structures, you might find that the you know some of the best savings from the system could come from just switching them to another rate structure. And so, uh, you know, they, maybe they don't need to know that, you know, and they won't really care if, you know, the savings come from the different rate structure or from the solar array on top, you know, they'll, they'll be happy to see, you know, their lower electric bill. And so here we, we have some, some more looks, you know, uh, here's helioscope integrated right into energy tool base. I think Helioscope is is making good strategic alliances to, uh, you know, kind of be that default 3D shade modeler. Uh, we're putting in the array size and the array cost and the tilt angle and the orientation. You know, otherwise it's just going to get its data from PV watts. You know, so here's our PV watts info. Uh, after you build your solar array, you build your battery, and uh, you know. So I think the battery component is is really where it's at. You know, it does it does battery modeling very well in ways that other softwares just aren't even thinking about. Uh, so we're putting in the size of our capacity, the maximum discharge power. That's going to vary wildly from lower end lithium ion to higher end lithium ion. Um, you know, so you do have to know a little bit about batteries. We have battery classes where we talk about these things in, in greater detail. Um, you know, so then it, it kind of tells us that the, the larger the system gets, 
you know, the, the lower our effective savings go. And so, you know, maybe starting out with a smaller battery is actually going to end up to be more cost effective than, than doing a large battery, which makes sense because a smaller battery only handles peak energy. A larger battery will get into base load. The closer you get to base load, the less cost effective that battery will be. Um, you know, I was, I was interested in, in seeing, okay, well, um, how do I know this model is working? And, you know, so here we have the, the solar array and the battery, uh, kind of only being charged by the solar array. So the, the battery is only being charged when the solar array is on. So that's a, a mode of operation for the battery. If you charge the battery with solar, then it qualifies it for the tax credit. Uh, we can see that the solar array is really too large. There's a lot of energy being exported to the grid. And so, um, you know, it, if, we're, if we're in a situation where the outflow onto the grid does not have a lot of value, uh, there's really no need for the solar array to be this large. It could be you know, uh, a, a good, you know, even, even half the size would be too large. It could be a third the size and still be reducing peak load during the middle of the day and providing enough energy to charge the battery. And so in, in here, you know, we're programming it to uh, target energy arbitrage and uh, rather than demand savings. Um, these can be a little finicky to play around with, nothing too complicated. And, and generally to make sure I know I've set my settings correct, I'll go in and, and look at the visualizations just to make sure the system is charging and discharging that battery when I, when I want it to. And so here we have a, a couple of different configurations. Uh, but, you know, you might be modeling it for solar or solar with, you know, without the battery or the battery without solar. You know, and so what we see is here for a, a $10,000, 10 kilowatt hour battery, uh, the battery is, is going through 129 cycles uh, a year. And each kilowatt hours saving it thirty eight dollars through uh, you know per kilowatt hour. And here we have a larger battery that's going through fewer cycles, and because we spent more money on it, it's not saving us as much money per kilowatt hour. And so I look at the, the effective generation rate, the effective cost savings of using the battery per kilowatt hour and, and, and kind of size my system smaller and smaller until the numbers start to be you know, good. And so what that might mean is here's, here's a battery that we wanted to run for three hours in the middle of summer and you know not buying it to be much more than that and so we're looking at you know that one day in summer on the peak day on the day of maximum usage and seeing that our battery discharges down to like a, a 23 percent state of charge over that period and we say okay we don't need a, a larger battery than that you know than the highest day's use plus 20 percent margin you know that's you know, that might even be 20% too large for that matter. You know, with time of use metering, not like a commercial kilowatt demand charge, but time of use metering, if you have a, some kilowatt hours where you're paying that peak rate, you know, it's bad, but it's not, you know, it's not as, as bad as uh, running out of battery capacity for demand savings. And so now we have a report that tells us how much is solar and how much is batteries and what our system payback is going, going to be, uh, you know, how much of our power is generated on site. 
you know, some nice, nice economic graphs, and we we get into our cash flow. Um, in the energy tool base reports, the there's a chart that gets into the utilization rate of the battery, and what I have found is that the 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 less cost effective the battery is the more it has a shallow utilization and not a full utilization and and the the you know what the utilization rate is is how much of the battery is used when it's being used and so you know on this this larger battery and the battery on the days of maximum discharge you know maybe one day out of the year it's being used to 80 percent whereas here you know with a five kilowatt hour battery with something a quarter of its size it's yeah it's being used you know almost every day to its fullest extent you know hopefully it's being used five out of every seven days right um and and so it's you know the the right what is the right size battery because lithium ion is very expensive you know so you want just enough to get through your your three hours of usage because that's what the rate structure is but not more than that you know some financial metrics you know some words of advice um let's uh just take a quick peek well i don't know I don't think we really have time in this program. Ah, whatever. Log into Energy Tool Base. Since I did get it set up for this class. And so here we are in Energy Tool Base. You know, some of this stuff should look familiar. You know, so here we have a, a proposal. And so, you know, if the economics don't look very good, that's because solar economics are not very good in Mississippi. It's probably the worst in the country. Um, so if you're taking this class in other markets, you probably have better economics than what are being shown. At the same time, that means in Mississippi, we have to be, uh, you know, very, very, you know, aware of, you know, not making the system so expensive that the client, you know, doesn't get any return on their investment. And so, so what I, what I have here is honed in on a, on a system that could have a 14 year payback and you know ironically it's a, a nine thousand dollar system and it's it's a very small solar array and a very small battery on a time of use rate structure and and that is because uh In Mississippi, you, you don't get anything for outflowing onto the grid. It's just not a, a very good deal. And so here we've we've modeled our, our energy use and our energy charges. You know, but what I like is the, the demand load profile where you can just click on, you know, let's say three days and and kind of see how the demand works. And, you know, if you wanted to turn off all the noise and just see the building load demand, you know, what we see is during that time of day period, the building being turned off. And then, you know, right when we're, we're done with the time of day period, the battery charges back up again. You know what I what I find particularly useful is so it's it's showing us the the kind of the, you know, if we go and we look at our, our battery state of charge, you know, we go and look over the entire month, 
you know, it, it, it calls us out, you know, what is our maximum time of use period before? And then you can say, okay, well, during that, that maximum period, you know, when, when is that? That's right around January 19th or so. So we're going to go take a look at that time frame. You know, we go and we look at our... Okay, so now we have, have a, a solar array coming on at the same time. So we can get into the, the solar array size, and here we have the, the system cost and the system size. Um, and we look at our, you know, kind of our calculations that are built into it right now. You know, we see our payback period down here in the corner at 13.7 years. If I said, okay, well, you know, I know that if we actually did like a 15 kilowatt solar array, you know, I could get that installed cost down to 250 a watt instead of $3 a watt, you know, and click save. You know, I don't have to get through the whole model you know, now it says my, my payback period is six years. Well, that doesn't make sense. You know why that is? Is because I, I, um, I put $3. Well, I thought I was putting $3 a watt. I put $3. Well, the system is not going to cost $2.50 for a 15 kilowatt array. You know, that's going to be a, a, a 37000 dollar five hundred dollar system and so now we go and see that the paybacks 24 and a half years instead of 13 and a half so you know even though we got them a lower price on a larger install uh, because most of that is outflow, it's not worth anything. And so we have to you know, only do little tiny solar arrays in Mississippi uh, in order for them to be cost effective. Um, unless we take the whole house completely off grid. That's a, another class for another time. Okay, so, so then... We get to the energy storage component, you know, nine thousand dollars, and so here's this blended savings number per per kilowatt hour. And so, you know, if we wanted to say, okay, well, if we can do a five kilowatt five kilowatt hour battery for nine thousand dollars, so this would be a, a kind of a higher end uh, lithium ion battery. You know, let's say we we did a a lower end like the Tesla Powerwall, but it's more capacity, and so there's there's you know let's say there's there's slightly more cost. So we're doubling the capacity, but we're only increasing the cost of the Tesla Powerwall to or whatever it is uh, by by a little bit. So fourteen thousand dollars for ten kilowatt hours, except it would be discharged over a two hour period instead of a one hour period. You know, so now we see that that blended savings figure has gone down and we'd see our battery utilization rate go up. And so, uh, you know, you, you don't have to get all the way to the very end where you're running a report to do it but here we are at the very end where we're running our report and we're seeing our our payback is not very good you know so so let's go back to our our original you know five kilowatt hour for nine thousand uh, dollar battery now that would be like a little uh, lithium nickel metal cadmium battery, a lithium NMC. 
and and now our our blended savings our generation rate is a little bit higher so we're going to our transactions and it's saying 23.7 years and it's like well that's just that's not that's not good enough so you know maybe we you know delete the solar array You know, our, our payback is about the same you know with or without the solar array it doesn't it doesn't really matter one way or the other and the payback on this particular battery is 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 22 years so uh, you know what we're seeing is that you know these high-end lithium ion you know in my particular market it's not it's not such a great deal um and and so as a strategy we're focusing right now on digital control systems that that fine-tune homes for time of use metering uh by by going af after device level electrical load controls rather than um complementing it with solar or batteries load considerations today's smart home television commercials reveal how little attention is being paid to energy management energy management can generate an economic payback faster than solar or batteries on their own while providing useful information for energy site planning automated load control means off-grid lifestyle can power more things. A well-sized off-grid system generates an overabundance of energy during the day. Load control, for example, can program a deep freeze to operate only at times of solar excess. Weather data can then be fed into a controller to recognize cloudy days, telling the freezer to then operate only during off-peak times until the sun comes back out. If the freezer lacks enough thermal mass to stay cold while powered off, the problem is easily solved with purchasing two freezers and filling each halfway up with gallon jugs of water. The total load of the building might increase through this strategy, but electricity being used to power the freezers can be turned on only when times uh, that electricity is cheapest. Solar monitoring is improving. For some time, the use of DC optimizers or microinverters has given the solar owner the ability to see the production of every single solar panel on the roof. But even with this overabundance of data, with a solar array on the roof, the homeowner can still be left in the dark with regard to how much energy from their solar array is actually being used by the building and how much of that energy is being sold back to the grid. The other piece to this puzzle is monitoring the electrical consumption of the building itself, knowing the electrical consumption data of the building to an exact degree will only improve any design process of adding solar arrays or batteries to the building. Net metering allows solar projects to be built somewhat blindly, assuming that the production of the solar array and the consumption of the building will even itself out at the end of the billing cycle. But even having monthly electric bills does not reveal the minute by minute level of detail of exactly how energy use in a building fluctuates. Consumption monitoring reveals how much electricity the building is using at any given time, often creating an energy log for later reference. Many companies sell products which install current transducers inside the electric service panel to communicate consumption data to a local or cloud network. Regardless, it becomes clear that residential electrical loads are very spiky with sporadic peak times where all the loads turn on at once combined with off-peak times when there is not much electrical load at all.
this fluctuation can be problematic. For example, if the utility buyback rate is substantially lower than what the customer is charged for electricity, the end result can be two thirds of a residential solar arrays production to be discounted 80% when bought back from the utility at the federal minimum. But storing that electricity in a battery isn't necessarily more cost effective because the cost to cycle the battery is within the range of the cost savings between the peak and off peak uh, charging and discharging times. You know, batteries have other values to residential customers such as backup power, but it's rare to make a grid tied residential solar battery more economic. But again, there is the problem that a Tesla Powerwall by itself only outputs 20 amps, but even an energy efficient air conditioner heat pump unit can momentarily draw 60 amps of power due to internal heating strips for defrosting. A residential service panel, after all, is rated for 200 amps. So even if the Tesla Powerwall were wired to power the entire house, only 10% of the service panel's maximum capacity can be used at any given time. Despite any extra surge capacity of the battery unit itself, the whole house would lose power the minute a 60 amp load turned on for more than a minute. While the entire house might only average 10 amps of instantaneous load over the course of the year, the minute to minute loads can surge if all the home loads turn on at the same time. This forces the owner to purchase numerous Tesla power walls if the goal is to back up the entire house, even if only for a couple hours. Imagine only having the budget for a single Tesla power wall such that only a critical load panel can be backed up during a blackout. This forces the customer to choose which electrical loads should be saved during the power outage and air conditioning is not on the eligibility list. But I grew up in Houston, Texas. I would give up my lights, the internet, and the food in my fridge before giving up air conditioning in Houston's 10 month long summer. Wouldn't it be nice to run the air conditioning and then have all of the other devices turn on when the air conditioner was not in use? An increasing number of both solar and battery inverters have relay signals built in, which can trigger a relay breaker to turn loads on and off as a function of solar or battery state of charge. For example, a hot water tank could be programmed to only turn on when the building energy load is below two kilowatts of power. This forces the hot water tank to only operate during off-peak times. Alternately, the hot water tank could be programmed to turn on only when solar production is above one kilowatt. This forces the hot water tank to be powered by the solar array as it is only on when the solar array is on, thereby reducing electrical outflow issues onto the grid. Battery inverters are expensive. Load control reduces the amount of inverter output capacity required to power multiple devices at the same time. So a home that might be fully backed up with four Tesla power walls instead can get away with two, although the duration for the storage capacity would be half that of the larger system. A fully off-grid house might be run with a 15 kilowatt battery inverter system instead of a 30 kilowatt battery inverter system because of load control. Load controls can increase the longevity and efficiency of a flooded lead acid or even lithium ion battery system. While lithium ion batteries do perform better than lead acid, they aren't perfect. The faster they discharge, the less efficient they get. But even without solar or without batteries, even in a non-emergency setting, energy load controls can result in substantial cost savings for the end user. 
any hot water tank can be put on intelligent controls to take advantage of a utility time of use rate structure. This can be triggered via the inverter relay to an automatic switch. This kind of setup is similar to how a whole house automatic transfer switch is triggered to start a generator while switching the home between grid and backup power, except this applies to a single circuit. Circuit level mechanical relays are great to manage a couple of heavy loads, but they can only go so far. Uh, there's no intelligence for optimizing these relays for anything other than basic controls which come with a pre-programmed controller. Such options are not always flexible to reprogram a relay for a particularly nuanced electric rate structure or grid policy. Digital controls would provide a greater customization with less required wiring. With digital controls that you can computer program, uh, preferably they're automated. You know, Non-critical loads of high energy use can become intelligent with digital controls. You know, digital controls can allow energy devices different modes of operation based on site conditions. The same controls which throttle a building's electric use when operating off a battery inverter in an off-grid setting can also take advantage of time-of-use rate structures during normal grid-tied operation. In this sense, digital controls allow the home or business owner to optimize their electric use for how they are being billed for their electricity. Commercial customers have the greatest opportunity for savings through load control. Once commercial building energy exceeds 200 amps, the maximum energy use of a standard residential electric service panel, the commercial business is considered a large business and they begin to incur electric demand charges. Demand charges are calculated at the highest 15 minute peak period of peak electric use for the entire month. Even with a modest demand charge of $10 per kilowatt, during that one 15 minute period, the electricity is costing the building owner $2.50 per kilowatt hour for each kilowatt of peak demand automatically reducing a commercial facility's energy use during this time period by turning off refrigerators, hot water tanks, and other non-critical devices for a short period of time can generate substantial cost savings with a one to two year simple payback occurring without any subsidy needed. Consider a modest hotel chain, the kind of hotels where each room has an air conditioner built into the wall. Everyone checks into the hotel in a rush, gets to their rooms, and cranks that air conditioning or heater, resulting in a huge spike in electric use. Staggering the air conditioner run times would result in the same amount of electricity being used as before, but the peak electrical demand of the hotel is reduced. Turning the air conditioners on and off from the front desk as a function of check-in or check-out status would result in further energy savings. Telling all the air conditioning to turn off for 15 minutes in all but a select few special rooms would result in a cash windfall for the hotelier. An optimal system can save the hotel money without any noticeable difference in comfort to the desk. First is that energy load controls can communicate wirelessly without connecting to the building internet. This reduces wiring and internet security concerns. It is a best practice to put Wi-Fi enabled smart devices on their own Wi-Fi network, a feature that high-end internet routers can manage virtually through software rather than literally installing a second Wi-Fi network throughout the building. But some smart home devices are more like installing a physical second Wi-Fi network for device communication. You know, instead of using a Wi-Fi antenna for communication, these smart devices use their own antenna on an alternate frequency. This keeps the smart home device communication physically isolated from the building internet, 
Uh, the Home Assistant Control Hub will benefit from an internet connection, but it is not necessary for Home Assistant to operate. In my case, I use Z-Wave devices, which uses a similar frequency to old school wireless telephones back before the cell phone era. But other platforms include Zigbee, 433 Hz RF frequencies, high frequency infrared, as well as 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz Wi-Fi. Without getting too far into which frequencies are best for what kind of communication, I'd say that absent a hardwired connection, Wi-Fi devices work best, although they come with their own risks. And for the consumption meter, I use it's Z-Wave. So I went with Z-Wave as my communication protocol. Home Assistant can actually manage multiple protocols at the same time. A consumption meter is installed in the electric service panel. A 40 amp wireless control switch has been installed on an electric tank water heater or for the hotel mentioned earlier, each in-room air conditioner would have such a switch. Plug-in wall plugs can be installed behind freezers, refrigerators, or even a battery uninterruptible power system that backs up a computer station. You know, behind the switch control boxes can control ceiling fans. There's a variety of loads that can be automated with Internet of Things devices. In a similar manner to using an Amazon Echo to ask Alexa to turn an Amazon light switch on or off, Home Assistant is programmed to give a wide range of Internet of Things devices a common vocabulary or platform to enable communication between them. Home Assistant is open source. It can be downloaded free and accessed and controlled over a local network, provided that the user has the encrypted username and password generated at the initial programming of Home Assistant. Once the devices are registered with Home Assistant, which is a tedious but not too difficult process, the automation menu allows the user to select which devices to automate based on data that the devices are collecting, as well as additional programming considerations. Here I have the energy devices set up to turn on and off as a function of home energy consumption meters. They could easily be programmed to turn on and off as a function of time of day or excessive solar production or a combination of all these options. So not only is the home energy monitoring the electrical consumption, but it's also using that data to improve the economics of the building electrical system through the load controllers without requiring solar or batteries. Because digital energy controls can be put to an economic use at a lower price point than solar or batteries, with a quicker payback than solar or batteries, uh, with a broader audience uh, than just solar or battery owners, uh, energy monitoring and load controls of the facility should probably be done first before planning a broader energy overhaul of the facility. Home Assistant has a popular chat room on Discord full of voluntary programmers wanting to help you better understand what to do to get started. If you are interested in learning more about home energy automation, I suggest joining that group. With that, we are out of time for this program. I hope you gain some insight into solar design and encourage you to continue with solar for your continuing education. You can find more in-depth material on my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash C slash community solar.